Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Ephesians and there to the sixth chapter. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We'll be moving down in our text this morning to verse 11. Ephesians 6, 11. I'm going to ask you to go to the Lord in prayer with me again as we begin this morning, and then we will start into this text. Ephesians 6. Father in heaven, thank you for your grace and mercy. The fact that that grace and mercy is abounding, and we praise you for it. We thank you for your word, that it is living and powerful, and that it gives us wisdom and insight that it speaks to the hearts and the minds of your people, strengthening them in Christ and causing them to stand fast and stand faithful. Father in heaven, this morning we pray that you would bless us with insight into these texts so that our minds would be attentive to your truth, that we would be focused on it to the praise and the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I want to ask you to look with me in our text this morning, Ephesians chapter 6, and begin with me in verse 10. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. This morning, as I mentioned, we are beginning to look at, in particular, the enemy and his methods. Next Sunday morning, we will look at the fact that the devil is indeed active, and you'll see more why we will have to address that subject next week. But a couple of Sundays ago, before we participated in the Lord's Supper last Sunday, we started into this text of Scripture and noted that As Christians, we are involved in a spiritual warfare. The apostle has spent significant amount of time in chapters 1 through 5 conveying to believers the basis of their salvation, the fact that in Christ they have become new creatures in Him, that they are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. As he moved into the fourth chapter, he began to address those good works. And into the fifth chapter, as they involve living a life to the praise and the glory of God in the context of a relationship with believers, in the context of a relationship between husbands and wives, in a context of a relationship between parents and children, and between even in the applicable parts of the text in chapter 6, that of employer and employee relationships or slaves and master relationship. And now he comes to this particular text of Scripture and notice in verse 10 he says, finally. And as we conveyed last week, what that word finally is doing is it is like a, a, a cord that is binding everything together. And he's saying, you need to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might And the reason for that is you are involved in spiritual warfare as a Christian. If you're a believer this morning, you are engaged in that warfare. You have an enemy that hates you and despises you and will do everything within his power and ability to destroy you and your life. Everything to destroy everything in your life that is about God, that is about Christ, that is concerning God. He is relentless, as we will see this morning, in His work. 
He despises anything in your life that has anything in the most remote cases to do with God. Because ultimately, he hates and he despises the Lord God Almighty. Now look closely at your text. He says in verse 11, the beginning phrase, and listen to this closely, don't be distracted from this text. Put on the full armor of God. Stop right there for a moment. And now move down in the same chapter with me to verse 13. There he repeats the same thing. He says, therefore, take up the full armor of God. So we see right here together two commands given to us to don ourselves with the full armor of God. But this morning we're going to be looking at those texts that appear between these two verses. Because between these two verses, he explains to us why it is the Christian needs or must don or put on or clothe himself or herself with the full armor of God. And in verse 11, he says, so that you may be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Immediately in this text, the apostle tells us the reason why we need to have the full armor of God on as believers is because we are engaged in spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare. Now, whenever you turn, and you don't need to do this now, but you can look at it later, the reference is in your bulletin, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. And that text tells us specifically that we are not fighting against flesh and blood. In essence, it's conveying that our battle that we are engaged in as Christians is a spiritual battle. But before we go on, we need to acknowledge something. These verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11 and 12, that convey this spiritual battle, they are indeed saying to us that the spiritual is one thing and the physical is another. That's a truth. But they are by no means communicating that the two never shall meet. That is false. The Bible beginning in the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, has communicated clearly to us that there are spiritual physical consequences to the spiritual decisions we make. The Bible in the Old Testament is replete with the destructive consequences of the spiritual battles fought on the earth. It started right there in the garden. God told Adam and Eve, in the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely die. Spiritual and physical brought together. Whenever Adam and Eve did sin by eating of the fruit, they were banned from the garden eventually, physical, because of a spiritual issue. And after they had their first two children, Cain and Abel, Cain, who the Bible says in 1 John 3 was of the evil one, rose up and he killed his brother Abel. At the essence of that murder, there was a spiritual issue, but there were physical ramifications. And you see that on and on and on throughout the Bible. You see it as well in the New Testament. At the same time, we also acknowledge on the positive side that there are great blessings that Christians partake of physically because of the spiritual things. That's a wonderful thing. For instance, Psalm chapter 1 says, Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. 
His leaf also will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. We see in that psalm the spiritual and then the blessings of obedience to the things of God's Word. The Apostle Paul himself said that he has fought the good fight. He has kept the, he has kept the, the faith. He's finished the course. Henceforth, he said there, as he wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. He was saying that I have walked and battled the spiritual fight of faith in a good way here in the earth, and as a consequence, there are physical blessings that await me in heaven. That crown of righteousness in particular there, and many other things. So, God in his word, whenever he says we're involved in spiritual warfare, is not ignoring and he's not negating the physical. Not at all. But what he is doing is he's focusing, he's drilling down on the essence of the battle. And the essence of the battle is that it is spiritual. The essence of the warfare is fought neither with flesh and blood, nor against flesh and blood, although they are involved in it. The war is instead a spiritual war. It's waged with real spiritual weapons. That's why he says here, take on the full armor of God. It is waged against real spiritual forces the devil being the head of those principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. It's real. It's real. Satan is named here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, under the title here of devil. And so we'll be looking at and spend some time this morning looking at the devil from a biblical perspective. And that's very important because, you see, in order to wage warfare and to be successful in the warfare, you need to have a certain level of understanding with regard to your enemy. You need to know who you're fighting and his habits. You need to understand the nature of his being. And beloved, since this is a spiritual warfare, you better not be taking any information from outside the sources of the written word because there is only one person who understands the enemy to the fullest, and that is God. So there is only one source of revelation for us in contending with the devil in this spiritual warfare. Other outside sources are nothing but demonic sources. It's the devil explaining himself. And as we'll see this morning, he is, according to Jesus in John 8, a liar. So any explanations about him that come from outside the source of God's written word are his explanations. And they are not founded in truth. And they are designed to destroy you. Now the Bible, and you can write these references down and look them up later. We're not going to turn to them this morning. The Bible explains to us in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 that de the devil had his origin from the fact that he was initially an angel. He was one of the angels that God created in the beginning. The Bible in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 11, tells us that in the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that is within them. And that includes angels. But some of those angels were elect angels. They were angels, according to Scripture, that were chosen to be ministers unto those, according to the book of Hebrews, who would inherit eternal life. But some of those angels were non-elect angels. And of those angels, there was one that Ezekiel 28 refers to as the anointed 
cherub who covereth. And that cherub was Satan. And at a particular point in time, the Bible describes to us there in Ezekiel 28 that sin was found in him. And he, according to Isaiah 14, attempted to usurp the authority of God. And God, according to Revelation chapter 12, cast him out of heaven and cast him to the earth. And so he shows up in the creation in the garden, deceiving Eve. And now this morning, what we're going to do, we're going to spend some time, that's his history, we're going to spend some time looking at specifically some of the names Scripture gives to him. Because in those names, there is conveyed the characteristic of his nature and his methodology as well. How he acts, how he carries out his warfare. And really, we're not going to look at the details on how he carries that out today. We'll do that, if the Lord wills, two Sundays from today. But for now, we need to acknowledge some aspects of the nature of the devil himself. Scripture assigns multiple names to Satan. It gives him, in these names, a description not only of who he is, but what he does. So we could say the names that Scripture allocates to the devil allude to both his nature as well as to his methods that he employs as he wages war. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, and chapter 20, verse 2 strings four of these names together. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 12 and look down in the text with me to verse 9. A corresponding text is Revelation 20 and 10, where it, or 20, excuse me, and 2, where it also brings these four names together. <clears throat> Revelation 20, or excuse me, 12 verse 9 says, and the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Notice four names given to him here. In this text, it is dragon. He is the serpent of old. He is the devil. He is Satan. Those are not his only names, as we'll see this morning. He has other names. But here before us are four very explicit and specific names. First of all, we'll address that name that God has called him by there in Ephesians chapter 6, the devil, that you may stand against the wiles or the schemes, as the text says, of the devil. The word devil translates a Greek word that means slanderer. The Bible also in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27 uses this particular word to express the evil of the ungodly and it is a word that literally means to lie in or to lay in wait for something. It, it has the idea, essentially, of, of, of slander, of communicating something that is, in essence, untrue. Take a look in your Bible with me this morning to the book of John, chapter 8, verse 44. John, chapter 8 and verse 44. John chapter 8, verse 44. In this particular text, it's very interesting because uh, Jesus here um, refers to the very nature of Satan and in view of this description gives a specific insight into his nature. 
John chapter 8, and there to verse 44. He said, you are of your father, the devil. He's referring to some unbelievers here who obviously, <clears throat> because he said that they are of their father, the devil, were unbelievers. But this context opened by saying that they were believers. The text and context begins in John 8, 31 and 32, and Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, but as we see in the context of this overall chapter, their belief was a mere profession. They professed Christ, but they didn't know him. Their belief was not genuine belief. And Jesus knew that, and he confronts the sin in them and refers to them here as those who are of their father, the devil. Another reference to keep in mind before we move into 844 here is Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. In that particular chapter, Satan is referred to as the slanderer or the accuser of the brethren. He accuses them before the throne of God, Revelation 12.10 says, day and night. He's about impugning the character of those who believe. You see an example of that in the Old Testament whenever Satan is talking with God and he refers to Job and he says, does Job worship you for nothing? Ultimately, in his accusation, it was against God. Because what Satan was saying to God is, God, you're not worthy in and of yourself to be worshipped. You have to pay people to worship you. And Job is one who is worshipping you because you pay him. He was falsely accusing Job and at the same time wrongly speaking of God and making an accusation against him. And ultimately, all of Satan's accusations against the people of God are leveled at God himself because God's the one who is working in them to will and to do of his good pleasure. They are those who have been created in the image of Christ. They are God's workmanship. So as Satan accuses them, he's ultimately accusing God and speaking against him. And in that, you can begin to see the evil of his character. But he's the accuser of the brethren, slandering them constantly as the devil. John 8, 44, Jesus speaks to one of the aspects of this slanderous character of the devil. In 8, 44, he says, you are of your father the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. Look at that verse. Five times in a single verse, Jesus referred to, in different ways, the fact that Satan is a liar. So you know what that means at the end of the day, beloved? You can never trust him. You can never trust him. You can never trust that anything he is speaking to you is true. And don't think for a moment that he isn't going to appeal to you using the word of God because he is, he does, and he will. But behind that use of God's word is a lie, just as he did in the garden, just as he does today. That's why it's critical for you and for me to know the word of God. If you don't know the word of God, you're at his mercy. And he has none. It should be a scary, sobering thought to us. That's why God says here, put on not the most, not much, not some, but the full armor of God. And he says and commands it two times. And then he gives, as we saw already, this incredible warning in between because you're involved in a spiritual battle. There is a devil out there 
And that devil hates and despises all of the people of God. Five times. Look at these references. First, Jesus said, He does not stand in the truth. Secondly, there is no truth in Him. Third, whenever He speaks a lie, He speaks from His own nature. Jesus is saying the core of His being is falsehood. He is a liar. And finally, He's the father of lies. Whenever you hear a lie, or if you're led to speak a lie or influence to lie, He's the one behind it. That doesn't let you off the hook. It doesn't let me off the hook. But ultimately, Satan is the father of lies. The Bible also describes Satan, as we saw back over there in Revelation 12, 9 and 22, as the devil. Revelation uses this term 13 times. And each time it is either speaking specifically to the devil, about the devil, or about those influenced by the devil. And it refers to him as the dragon. He's the dragon. This word speaks to the ruthless character of Satan and his deeds. We just read there in John 8.44 that Satan is a murderer from the beginning. He deceived Eve and that led to her spiritual death and inevitably, ultimately, to her physical death and her banishment from the garden and then to the death of her firstborn son, Cain. He's ruthless. He's a murderer. Jesus, in John chapter 10, verse 10, referred to him most likely as the thief. And Jesus said of the thief, He comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Whenever Peter was writing about him in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he referred to him or likened him to a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Have you ever watched the nature programs and seen lions stalk and destroy their prey. It is a ruthless, gruesome task. It's mercilessly carried out. We see this exhibited in other places of the Scripture. You remember in Exodus chapter 1? In Exodus chapter 1, the Bible tells us that there rose up a Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. And you remember that the children of Israel began to multiply and spread out in the land of Egypt. And the Pharaoh, because he was concerned about that particular aspect of the population increasing and becoming rulers over the Egyptians, he came up with a plan to destroy all the sons born to the Israelite people. So he spoke to two of the handmaids, you remember, and he said, listen, whenever the Israelite women give birth to their children, if the child is a girl, let it live. But if the child is a boy, kill it. Kill it. You see, Pharaoh, he didn't have the technology at hand in that day to see into the womb. Had he had the technology to see into the womb, they would have been performing abortions right and left there in Egypt. But he had to wait for the delivery. And the moment the delivery occurred and the child was a boy, kill him. Well, you remember that those two handmaids spared some of those Egyptian children as they were enabled to, or excuse me, those Israeli children as they were enabled to. And from that group came a baby named Moses. But pause for a second, and I'll just remind you of the fact. Do you see the spiritual warfare behind that? 
ultimately the seed of the woman from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 would come from the children of Israel and that was disclosed already in the Old Testament text. Satan knew it and he was there about in Egypt trying and attempting to destroy the Lord Jesus Christ and his coming to the earth. Listen closely. You remember whenever Jesus was born? In the book of Matthew, chapter 2, Herod, whenever he found out that the wise men had deceived him, he ordered that all of the children, the male children, from two years old and younger were to be destroyed. They were to be killed. The Bible again in Revelation, chapter 12, depicts Satan as waiting for the birth of the Messiah to kill him. He is the dragon. He's ruthless in his activity. Don't think for a moment he will have mercy on you. He will not. Mercy is never one of his character traits. If a person thinks they are getting off it's only because they're fulfilling his plan for the moment, but destruction awaits them in the end. The Bible refers to Satan also in Revelation 12, 9 and 22 as the serpent of old. That's a reference back to Genesis chapter 3. And there it not only embraces a physical real serpent, but ultimately the one influencing that serpent Satan himself. And whenever the Bible speaks of him as the serpent of old, one of the main truths it's communicating to us is the fact that he is crafty. He's cunning. He has the ability to wait and watch, just as he waited for Eve. He must have known her habits. He must have seen her time after time or at least was ready whenever she came to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he was ready for her there. And he was ready with a deception, a lie, and it worked. He must have been ready for Cain. The Bible says that God spoke to Cain and he said to Cain that sin is lying at your door and its desire is for you. And it took it. Satan has been with humanity from the very beginning, beloved. He knows how we operate. This text in Ephesians 6 is about us understanding his operation. We have to be informed. He has 4,000 or 6,000 years of history behind him. Watching who? People. Whole cultures. Whole kingdoms. He understands us. He is known most commonly by his name, Satan. The word appears more than 50 times in the Bible, and it means adversary. He is the enemy of God. He is the enemy of the people of God. He's intrinsically and adamantly opposed to all that is good and called good and all that is God-honoring. He is referred to also as, in the same vein, he's referred to as the evil one. The evil one. Scripture ten times refers to him as the evil one. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, in the text that we are at, we are exhorted to take up the shield of faith with which we may be able to extinguish all the fiery darts, the text says, of the evil one. He is the evil adversary. Also another text, another reference for you. And understand this one. He is referred to as the God of this world. 
The text says that if our gospel in verse 3 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 says that if our gospel is hid, it is hid to those who are perishing, in whom, now referring to Satan, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. As the God of this world, he maintains a supernatural position of authority over aspects of the creation. Turn in your Bible with me to the book of Luke chapter 4. Luke 4, and notice as you examine this, what the devil says as he speaks to Satan, or as he speaks to Christ. He is tempting Christ here. <clears throat> And in verse 5, Luke 4, 5, Satan led him, that is Christ, up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, I will give you this domain and its glory, for it has been handed over to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall be yours. Now, Jesus didn't contend with the devil with regard to whether or not he was the God of this world and had authority over these things. He received the things of the creation when Adam and Eve sinned. Because whenever they sinned, they succumbed to his lie ultimately. And in succumbing to that, they were separated from God and they gave what God had given to them, the dominion over the earth, to Satan. And so Satan now, lyingly, promises it to Christ if only Christ would serve him. But the fact is that Jesus did not contend with him about whether or not he had authority over the earth. He does. He reigns with a certain level of authority, not over the earth in the sense that he reigns outside of God's sovereignty, certainly not. Everything that he does, he does within the sovereign will and decree of God. He's under God's constraint. He's not, he's not, all-sufficient, nor is he all-knowing, nor is he all-powerful. He operates under the ultimate authority of God. But according to Job, he has the ability to control armies in Job chapter 1. He is able to control the wind. You remember a wind, a strong wind came up and destroyed Job's children. He has the ability to rain down fire from the sky, according to Job chapter 1. And in Job chapter 2 and verse 7, Satan clearly has the ability to inflict physical disease because that's what he inflicted Job with. Four times the Bible indicates that Satan possesses the host of heaven, that is, fallen angels. The host, I should say, of fallen angels. We also know them as demons or devils. And these devils are in, eternally bound to do Satan's bidding. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26, listen to this closely that he holds the lost captive to do his will. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says that the entire world, and he's talking about the entire world of the lost in that context, lies in the arms of the evil one. All those people who do not know Christ who are unsaved, are within his bosom. They're held close to his heart. He's on them and controls them. 
In John chapter 13, you remember, we've cited this text a couple of times recently. Verse 2, He put it into the heart, now listen closely to this, to betray Christ. He put it into the heart of Judas to betray Christ. He was under the, or Judas was under his control. Later in Revelation chapter 13, and verse 27, he, Satan, actually entered into Judas and empowered him to go and betray Christ. And Judas was promised money for doing that. You remember, 30 pieces of silver. You remember I mentioned to you early on that Satan may th make a person think at times they are gaining from serving him or following his words, and that's what Judas thought. But that's only so long as they do his bidding, and whenever he's done with them, as in the case was with Judas, Judas went out and he hanged himself. Satan was done with him and killed him. Satan will be the one, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9, and Revelation chapter 13, 2, and verses 11 through 18. He will be the one who gives his power to the Antichrist and to the false prophet. And the false prophet, because of the empowerment of Satan, will be able to perform, as 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, in conjunction with the Antichrist, lying wonders false wonders, things that appear to be miraculous. But in reality, they are deceptions of Satan performed through those individuals. Listen, through the use of devils, according to the book of Revelation 16, Satan will gather the nations together against Christ at the battle of Armageddon. He will gather them up and bring them together against Christ when He returns. And then after the thousand year reign of Christ is over, according to Revelation chapter 20, Satan will be released for a short time from the bottomless pit, or excuse me, from the abyss. And the moment He is released, He begins to function as He normally did on the inhabited of the world, as he will deceive the nations and bring them together against the people of God in Jerusalem before God destroys those armies. The armies referred to there as Gog and Magog. So he is in control of the loss. He is the spirit that's at work, as Ephesians 2 says, in the lives of those who are lost. The spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience. Finally this morning, the last name that we'll look at that's assigned to Satan in Scripture is the name Tempter. He's the Tempter. Two times the Bible refers to him as the Tempter. Matthew chapter 4, verse 3, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5. And as the Tempter, he appeals to the lusts of men, to their fallen nature. In the Christian, he appeals to the flesh, and he tempts them. And we'll spend some time, if the Lord wills, when we get into his methodology, looking at the significance of that. But we need to acknowledge that it's Satan who's behind the temptation. But the fact that Satan tempts does not let the sinner off the hook. Sinners are responsible for their sin. And the wages of that sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. All of these names and others that Scripture assigns to the devil speak to his nature and to the activity of the devil. And in addition to these, we see right here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, that Satan has a strategy. 
He has a strategy that you may be able to stand against the schemes, the text says, of the devil. The King James translates it that this way. It uses the word wiles. Both words translate a Greek word, methodia. And it is descriptive here, again, of that aspect of lying in wait. Of lying in wait. The text indicates that Satan acts according to his devices and his plans. He lies in wait, watching, waiting, actively involved in the execution of his plan. Satan does not act haphazardly. He plans and he works his plan. He does not wage war capriciously. He wages war strategically. There's a method, we might say, to his meanness. And listen, there is only one way to be delivered from him. Only one. Satan's captives cannot release themselves. They need deliverance. They cannot perform self-deliverance. It's impossible. Satan is too strong. They are too fallen. In a sense, they actually love being bound to him because he feeds their lusts. Jesus said of Satan that he favors not God or the things of God, but man and the things of man. He feeds their lusts. He feeds it. But beloved, God is merciful. And it is God who delivers. Whenever a person recognizes that they are a sinner and that their sins ultimately are against God who is holy, 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 and they genuinely recognize that. They do so because of a work God has done in them. And then they see that there is deliverance, not in themselves, not in their works, but in God and His works. And that particular work is Jesus Christ. He's the person. And the person and the work of Christ is that which delivers God's people from the domain of darkness, according to Colossians chapter 3, into, or chapter 1, verse 13, into the kingdom of the Son. God is the deliverer. And He delivered His people by sending Jesus Christ to the cross. And Christ on the cross paid for the sins of those for whom He died. And whenever He paid their debt on the cross, in the payment of that debt that they owed not to Satan, but to God, He satisfied God's wrath on their behalf. It was a work between God and Christ and the Holy Spirit, according to Rome, or Hebrews chapter 9. They were all three together working the redemption of humanity, and in particular, the sheep for whom Christ died. He saved them. He obtained their eternal redemption on the cross. And whenever they hear His voice, they follow Him. Jesus said it this way, My sheep hear My voice, I know them, and they follow Me. They follow Me. They believe. And whenever they believe, they begin to realize in their life that one, there's no other Savior but Christ. 
Listen, for anyone who believes that they are saved by Christ and their good works, or believes that Christ is one of multiple aspects of a means to salvation, they are deceived by Satan because there is salvation in no one else but the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can put a period there. Jesus said it this way of himself, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. But through me. You see, whenever Jesus died on the cross, one final note this morning. He was redeeming his people from their sin. And ultimately, from their bondage to the devil. What a praise that is. He wasn't paying the devil anything. The payment, the transaction was all between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Period. There is a theory out there called the ransom theory. It was popularized by um, C.S. Lewis, and it was made eventually into a movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And in that, God is depicted as paying Christ, who is the ransom, to Satan. And that's just not biblical. The Bible makes it very explicit in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2, and many other places that Jesus worked with regard to the things pertaining to God, not the devil. And in delivering his people in their relationship with God, he delivered them ultimately from the devil. What a praise and a blessing that is. I'm going to ask you to stand this morning with me. There is redemption in no one else but Christ. There is deliverance from the domain, the dominion of darkness in no one else but Jesus Christ. It's not a work that an individual can do. It's simply believing in Him. Believing in Christ. Calling out on Him for salvation. The Bible says multiple times over, but specifically, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the biblical exhortation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you and praise you for the deliverance that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he has delivered us from the bondage of the evil one. Have mercy on your people. Lord, that we can understand his strategies and his nature insofar as you have revealed it in Scripture, that we may wage a warfare on a spiritual level that affects our physical being to the praise of your goodness and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.